Well, happy Easter to everybody. He is risen, amen? amen. That's why we're here. That's why, that's why we have one of the biggest services of the year on Easter Sunday is to commemorate what took place on this day over 2,000 years ago. You wouldn't be here if it wasn't for what happened that day, and that's Jesus' resurrection. Amen? Most of you guys know me today as uh, uh, Pastor Jason Neely, but um, my, my ulterior name today is Cleopas. Cleopas, yes. Most of you don't know me, but I am a friend of Jesus. I'm his friend. And in fact, my name is mentioned in Scripture just one time, only one time. That's probably why many of you don't even know who I am, Cleopas. But that one Scripture in all of the Bible is one that I would treasure forever, for all of my life. And I wouldn't trade it for anything, wouldn't trade it for the world, because it's that one Scripture where I walked with Jesus. I walked with my Lord that day. In fact, somebody was there and took a picture of us walking here on this trail. See my stick right here and that, that fellow right there? Yeah, I got a photograph of us. My name is Cleopas, and that was the day that we walked with the Lord. We walked with Jesus on the road to Emmaus. You guys have heard that before, the road to Emmaus? This is the Emmaus experience that I had. I enjoyed it. We walked everywhere we went. You know, you'd walk here and walk there, and unless you were really wealthy and had a donkey, or if you had a lot of money, you had a horse. The Romans had all the horses because they had all the money. They've been taking so much of our tax money to buy themselves nice horses. I had to walk everywhere. We all did. Most of us just walked barefoot. A few of us could afford sandals, or in my case, flip-flops. Yeah. Tiva. These are good quality flip-flops right here, Tevas. You know what Teva means in Hebrew, right? No? Teva, happy foot. Amen. Anytime you don't have to go around barefoot, you got happy feet. That's not really what it means. I don't know, have a clue what it means, but just thought I'd pull your leg a little bit. Some of you are like, wow, that's amazing. Happy feet, you're gonna go out and tell somebody what it means now. Oh, that's funny. Yeah, we had a, a trip to Emmaus. That's what, that's what this passage of Scripture was about. There in the book of Luke in chapter 24 is where my name is mentioned there in your Scriptures. I lived in Emmaus for most of my life. Emmaus was a nice, small bedroom community to Jerusalem. I like getting out of the big city. I don't like all that hustle and bustle that was out there. That's too many people and it stresses me out. So I only went to the big city once in a while, but it's still close enough to make the missus happy to enjoy all that shopping. You guys, you know what I'm talking about? Yeah. It's only about a half day's journey. It's not too rigorous. It's not too strenuous. It's only roughly about seven miles away from Jerusalem. I can do that. You could do that. That's the road to Emmaus. It's roughly about the same distance as from this spot where you're seated right now up to the Cory store. Some of you are just kind of blowing your minds right now. That's not strenuous? What are you talking about? Well, for people in my day and age, when we walked everywhere, that's not bad. From here to the Cory store would not be but a half day's journey. I was a good Jewish man. I observed the law and the writings of the prophets. I went to synagogue services every single day, every, every single week. Just like Jesus, when the Bible says Jesus went to synagogue and it was as his custom, he went. I was a good Jewish man. I followed the law and the prophets. And I went to my church service, my synagogue services. I sacrificed at the temple. We had sin offerings and fellowship offerings there at the temple. We enjoyed those moments to go up and we sensed a closeness to God. But still, it was just a religious tradition. A lot of people that would go there, and it was just the, the rote tradition of religion, doing it because we did it, because that's always what we used to do. So during those times of sacrifice, when I was giving of the sin offering, I had to give a lot of sacrifices, you know, a lot of sin offerings. But during the usual course of the things, it, it kind of lost its significance. It lost its its power in my life. And I felt that little emptiness. Something was missing. Just going through rote religion no longer mattered to me in my life. And so we were looking for something different. We were looking for the Messiah. 
The Messiah there in the Law and the Prophets was explained to us, and we saw it throughout the different writings of the Torah. There was to be a Messiah expected. We did not know who he would be or when he would come. We had no idea. We simply just had to wait and wait and wait. My fathers expected him to come. My grandfathers expected the Messiah to come. My great-grandfathers expected the Messiah to come. And still we wait. Still we wait for the coming of the Messiah. There are a lot of different powerful men that seem to sway the crowds with their words. But all of those powerful men, they all came and they all went. Most of them had been killed by the Romans for leading rebellions against the state. However, there was, there was this one rabbi. There was this one teacher. A powerful man. Powerful in word and in deed and in action. Powerful individual. He swayed the hearts with his words. Swayed the hearts of his countrymen. He had the power to heal people. And I saw this teacher, this great rabbi, heal a man with my own eyes right there in Jerusalem when I was there for one of the feasts. He stretched out his hand and he told him to walk. And I saw this lame man that I've been seeing for years get up and walk. That was a day that, that blew me away with its power. And from that day forward, I knew that without a doubt that this was the man who would deliver us from the hands of the Romans. I bought into this man. I bought into this man's teachings, hook, line, and sinker. I followed ardently after him after that point. This was a man that could really lead us and unite Israel once more. Some of this man's teachings and sayings were hard, though. Some of what he said was very difficult. One of the difficult things that he had said, that he had mentioned, he admitted that he was the Son of God. This man admitted he was the Son of God. In our Jewish traditions, that was blasphemous. Blasphemous. And our religious leaders very much took issue with this rabbi, this teacher. Took issue with this man named Jesus because of his claims. Look, I'm all about following great men with great words, but at first this declaration of his divinity struck me as delusional. But I began to search, search the scriptures a little bit more. And as I continued to walk through the words of the Torah, I began to understand that this man's claim must be true. It had to be true. This required me to have faith in this man. It was not an easy decision, but his words were confirmed by his power and his miracles. It was amazing what Jesus could do. And I had to decide something about Jesus. I had to decide something about him. And I chose, I chose to believe in him. Every single man, woman, and child is confronted by the man Jesus. And every single man, woman, and child has to make a choice. A lot of people had to make these choices, and we could sense that there was a battle beginning to brew in Jerusalem. We were close enough in proximity, living in Emmaus, to know that something was amiss. Something, there was some friction in the air. It was becoming seismic. The Bible says it's seismic. There was a shaking in the air taking place. We had heard that Jesus was, in fact, coming back to Jerusalem for the Passover. I could not believe it when I heard he was coming back to the Passover because you know what had happened last time he showed up, right? Well, the Pharisees had plotted to kill him. All of the the religious leaders had plotted to kill Jesus. And he managed to slip away unharmed. But now he was coming back so soon, it had only been a few weeks. And when he came back, did he ever come back? I mean, this guy not only made an entrance, he made a messianic entrance. He arrived like a king. Many of us knew him to be. He arrived like a king. He fulfilled prophecy and scripture just by coming in on a donkey and fulfilling some of the prophetic understandings and renderings of the Torah. And the people were crying out there in the streets, Hosanna, Hosanna. They were waving these little palm branches. 
Palm Sunday, and were welcoming the king as he came in on his donkey. And people were, were throwing their cloaks down on the ground like a red carpet for the Messiah. So Jesus didn't only just come back. He came back in style. He was declaring something. He was continuing to, to, to underline the fact that he was the Messiah. Continuing to emphasize the fact that he was the Son of God. And this was the day, this Palm Sunday, this first day of the week, that now Jesus is finally coming into Jerusalem in power. Yeah. He is the Son of God, and he's coming in like he should be because he's going to be declaring a rebellion against the Romans, beginning to, to set us free as a people. And the people are excited. We're all fired up, pumped up to see this, this prince come in on this cult. Unknown to us, however, Judas, one of the 12 disciples, had made arrangements to betray Jesus somehow to these religious leaders, to these priests. I'm told, I heard, that while Jesus was praying on the Mount of Olives, they seized him in the night. After he had finished one of his Passover meals, after he had finished the Seder, he went to the, to the Mount of Olives to pray, to seek God, to seek the Heavenly Father. And in the midst of prayer and meditation, they come in the night with swords and spears and clubs and torches, and they seize this innocent man. For what reason? Why would they do that? Then these religious people, they took Jesus, a man of innocent blood, and they, they marched him over to the Romans, and then they made the Romans do their dirty work. And the Romans, they, they beat him. They tortured him to the point where he was unrecognizable. Then they began to lead him along the road, the way of sorrows, the road of sorrows. We know it as the Via Dolorosa, bloodied and broken. And then they raised him up on that cross, and they na they nailed him on that cross. They were, they raised him up for all to see, and he died on that cross. He died on that cross. Why did that have to happen? Why did that have to happen? Why? Why did that have to happen? Me and his followers, we did not understand. My heart had been ripped from my chest. My hopes for the future died with Jesus. I had not bought into all the different messiahs that it claimed to be, but this man, I had bought into him because of his power, the power of his words and the power of his healings. Why now? Why did this have to happen? We were evidently condemned as a people to continue under the tyranny of the Romans. And evidently we were condemned to live under the tyranny of our religious leaders as well. It was not something that we could understand or that, anything that we could fathom. But we had to continue to go on. That was the darkest day of my life, friends. Watching Jesus walk past me on that Via Dolorosa, bearing that cross. I had wanted to help him. But I was too scared to. My fear and my cowardice was overwhelming the bitterness of that moment, seeing who I thought was my Messiah walking by and all the swords and spears surrounding him, prodding him on. I didn't want one of those swords or spears prodding me on. So I stayed silent. I said nothing. I said nothing, nothing, nothing. I didn't say a word. In fact, I couldn't even make eye contact with him. I was so ashamed of what was taking place. Peter may have denied him three times. But I said nothing. I'm just as guilty as Peter. I'm just as guilty as he was. Just by my inability or my lack of doing anything, that shame surrounded me. Well, after Jesus was murdered and killed, my friend Bartholomew and I stayed in Jerusalem for another day. Shocked as you can imagine, by the turn of events. Shocked by all that had happened. 
I was bewildered, depressed. Once we had been so certain, and now we're uncertain. We had no idea what was going to happen. We had no clue about how to go forward. The disciples were in hiding. I had tried to find one of them, but no one seemed to know where they were. The last I had heard, they had went in every direction. I wanted to ask them, what do we do now? But none were around to be found. I suppose it's possible that they had turned tail and ran as fast as they could back to Capernaum, or at least back to the area of Galilee to flee. I don't know. I wouldn't blame them. Wouldn't blame them in the least after they had just, the Romans had just murdered Jesus. They would probably be very fearful of being murdered and killed themselves, accused of crimes they did not commit, being hung on a cross themselves. When will it end, friends? When will God truly send his Messiah? How much longer do we have to continue to, to suffer under these tyrants? Well, Bartholomew and I, after having finished observing the Passover, we continue to be sick with grief, outraged by our leaders, disgusted by the Romans. We then set out on the short journey home to Emmaus. I'll tell you, that was the longest walk home that I'd ever had in my life. You ever have one of those long walks home, long walks home in your life? Where you get the news from a doctor, bad news, and it seems like the road home is a lot longer than it used to be because your thoughts are so troubled. That's what it was like in my life. Walking on the road to Emmaus, just seven miles, but it was a long, long journey, at least the first part of that journey was difficult. We were troubled in our hearts, Bartholomew and I, walking on that long, dust, dusty path, mulling over all the different things that we had seen and experienced and discussed. Very, very troubled because all of a sudden we start hearing that this very morning that some of, our, some of the ladies there, they were close associates of the disciples, came running in and saying that, that Jesus' body was gone. I mean, what's all that about? We had waited around for more news, and we never heard anything more, and the time is getting late, and we decided we get, we've got to get home. We've been away now for a couple of days. We need to get back to the family, and so we went ahead and set out. And while Bartholomew and I were discussing these things and kind of chewing on it a little bit and trying to figure things out, there was a stranger who came up behind us, and he, he joined us a little ways, and Bartholomew and I continued to have our, our dark dialogue, our depressed dialogue, and all of a sudden this man said, what are you talking about? What do you mean? What's going on? Well, at first when he said that, what are you talking about? I was like, kind of stopped in our tracks a little bit. And we looked at him and I said, are you kidding me? What are we talking about? Where have you been? At first I thought this guy was an idiot. Where have you been? This guy is on the same road that we are coming from Jerusalem. How could he have not have heard about all of the events in Jerusalem? It was, the, it was the front page news. How could you not know all these things that had transpired? We told this man about what had taken place. We had told him about our, our love and trust in Jesus. We had thought he was the Messiah. We told this stranger that this man had claimed to be the Son of God. Kind of when I said that. It was kind of a bitter, cruel joke. The bitterness and the bile kind of rose up inside me again just to feel like I'd been betrayed by this man, Jesus, claiming all that he claimed, and now he's dead. But then this man spoke up, this stranger, and his words seemed to slap me across my face. It seemed to slap across my soul as well. He said, he said how foolish you are. And how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Christ have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? First of all, I don't like anybody calling me a fool. And it kind of shocked me a little bit. I had no words to say. Somebody saying how foolish I am. I had no words to say. And for me, having no words to say, that's quite a feat. But after I allowed my blood pressure to reside, reside and go down a little bit, this man's words, I started listening to them. 
And as we continue to resume walking down this long, dusty road of Emmaus, his words not only was I hearing them, but they were, they were making good sense. And mile after mile, he walked us through the scriptures of the law and the prophets, the writings and the, the writings of the Torah, and I began to understand exactly what it was. God's plan and intent was, was for the Messiah to come to not conquer Romans, but to conquer my fear, to conquer sin, to conquer death, hell, and the grave. That's why the Messiah had come. And as we approached my village of Emmaus, the man acted like he was going on. But with the conversation the last two miles, I simply could not let this man leave. His teachings on the scripture were so powerful, unlike anything I'd ever heard before. I had to hear more. And I made up any excuse that I could to try to get this man, this stranger, to stay with me in Bartholomew. We we're there at the, at the driveway to my house, and I didn't want him to go on. I persuaded and persuaded and persuaded him to stay. And finally, he relented. I said, hey, my wife can make a great matzah. Come on in. He said, oh, yeah, I love a good matzah. So he came in, and we kind of, we, we set the table together. We began to, to commune and prepare for dinner. And I asked this stranger, I asked him, with his great knowledge of understanding and wisdom, he had to be a teacher or a rabbi, I asked him to pray the blessing over our fellowship and over our meal. And, and he, took that, he took that bread and he lifted it up and he blessed it and he broke it and then he gave it to us, to Bartholomew and I. And it was at that very moment, our eyes became as wide as, became as, wide as saucers as you can imagine because it was at that very moment that our eyes were opened, not only physically, but spiritually. And then we began to realize that this stranger, who had never given us his name on the road, we now recognize that this man was our Messiah, Jesus, standing there in front of us. Then he kind of smiled a little bit. And poof, he was gone. Disappeared. I kind of looked over at Bartholomew to see if everything was okay. His eyes were as wide as my eyes, and we're, we're looking at each other. I wanted to see if he had seen what I had seen. And evidently, because he was white as a sheet, and I must have looked the same to him, because we were both white as a sheet, and we didn't know what we had just seen. Something powerful and supernatural had just taken place. But Jesus was in our midst, and he had spent time with us as he walked with us mile after mile. And who am I? I'm just Cleopas. I'm not one of the twelve. I'm a follower of Jesus, but I wasn't like the disciples. Why did he spend time with Bartholomew and I? Why would he do that? I'm a nobody. I'm a nobody. But yet, I persuaded him to come into my home, and he did. And he broke bread with me, and he blessed us. Someone is getting hungry for the Hunger Games. <laughs> so at that very moment, as we were gathered there together, there in that room, what did we do? Bartholomew and I, we were, we were looking and looking. Couldn't find Jesus anywhere. Obviously gone. I grabbed my cloak once more and I wrapped it around us. My wife says, Cleopas, what are you doing? Where are you going? And I said, I've got to find them. I've got to find those men. I've got to find the disciples. Why? Because Jesus is alive. Jesus is risen. And I've got to spread the good news to my friends. They were broken and they were doubting. I don't know if they're still in Jerusalem or not. But I've got to try. I've got to go and find them. Because Jesus is alive. Because he was walked with me. And he talked with me. And he was in my home. I've got to tell them the good news. That Jesus is alive. It's not a lie. It's not a lie. It is true. Friends, that the darkest week of my life at that moment when I saw Jesus turned to the most euphoric week of my life. What I had always thought of as the Messiah had just been totally turned upside down and turned around. And I now understood. I now understood the purpose and the power of Jesus Christ. I understood now that Jesus was indeed setting up his kingdom, but his kingdom was not of this earth. His kingdom was of heaven. His kingdom will be of earth someday. 
when he comes back. But it's not yet. Not right now. His intent was never to overthrow the Romans as I had thought, but his intent was to give all the people the chance at redemption with God. I no longer have to go to the temple to offer sacrifices. I no longer have to do that. Because I have accepted Jesus as the Messiah, as the anointed one, as the Savior. And I now understand that Jesus is the Lamb of God. I used to tell you, I have to take many lambs there to the temple to sacrifice that innocent lamb for my sin offering, to be in right standing before God. I don't have to do that anymore because Jesus was the final sacrifice. He was the last one. He replaced all of the sin sacrifices ever needed and ever bore required. His blood is so substantial. His shed blood on that cross was for you and I for our sin, friend. It's for all of us both the people of that time all the way into the future, the people of this time and for the future on. His blood was shed for you and me. I go to the temple still to worship, but I don't have to take the lamb any longer. I've been set free from that because the lamb of God has broken that chain in my life. I'm no longer chained to the law Jesus had come to fulfill that law and set us free. Jesus was the most perfect and unblemished sacrifice. He was the Son of God. He allowed himself to step into that sacrificial role. He didn't want to. Remember at the Garden of Gethsemane, he cried out, Father, take this cup from me, this cup of suffering. I don't want to do it, but yet, Lord, not my will, but your will. But Jesus was obedient to the Father, and he willingly laid down his life as that sacrifice for you and I. I now live for Christ. I now live for Jesus. Who do you live for? Who do you live for? Do you live for yourself? If you do, that can provide some pleasure from time to time, but it's not long-lasting. It's fleeting. The power of Christ will never lose its power. The blood of Jesus will never lose its power. Miss Ashley, if you come to the keyboard this morning, would you stand with me today as we close? Friend, maybe you're looking for something real. Maybe like Cleopas, you had put a lot of a lot of bank into somebody else or another institution, an organization, a boss, maybe even a spouse. And you know, as well as I do, that those things will let you down. Sometimes they call believing in Jesus or believing in Christianity a crutch. I tell you, believing in yourself or believing in your boss or believing in the government, that's a crutch, friend. The Bible says that when we are weak, He is made strong. So in my, weak, in my weakness, Jesus is more glorified. I am not a weak man. I am strong. But in my own spiritual strength, I am weak. And there will come a day that in my physical man, I will become weak. And so I choose to, to lean upon the power and strength of Almighty God at all times. Because I know that I make mistakes. I get tripped up from time to time. Jesus is my friend. The Bible says that he's a friend that sticks closer than a brother. My friends, Cleopas had this relationship with Jesus. And many of us here today, most of us perhaps here today, have that close relationship with Jesus. But it's just with anybody. Friend, coming to church and being a part of a church doesn't get you to heaven. It doesn't get you prepared for the return of Christ. What gets you prepared for the return of Christ, what gets you right with God, is accepting the shed blood of the Lamb, the innocent Lamb of God, Jesus Christ, into your life and walking with Him day after day after day walking with Christ.
Friends, the Roman government, it let me down. My bosses let me down. Sometimes my religious institutions that I had believed in let me down. But Jesus has never let me down. Jesus has always been there. He's always been faithful. He's walked by me. In the hard times, he's been there. In the good times, he's been there. In the hard times, I hear his voice. And in the hard times, I sometimes don't hear his voice, but I I sense his presence, and I know he's not left me nor forsaken me. Sometimes I just need to know his presence is real and is there.